Good morning, and thank you for coming to the event despite all the travel warnings and scary news out there. Um, I would like to sort of encourage people not to shake hands, but to, um, we've tried many alternative ways of uh, uh, saying hi, the foot bump and the <laughs> hold your heart and the namaste and Pat um, also has the dinosaur <laughs> greeting, which I'm not sure is going to take off, but <laughs> so you can do any of those variants, but uh, don't shake hands. The last news that we want to come out of here is that there was a bio summit at the Media Lab and everybody got infected with COVID-19. <laughs> we have enough, uh, <laughs> enough news that we've dealt with <laughs> recently. So um, I am running a research group here at the Media Lab already. I've been here for 30 years. Um, and um, I also happen to be the chair of the executive committee right now as we are sort of searching uh, for a new director for the lab. Uh, for those of you that actually have not been here or that are new, the Media Lab is um, 35 years old um, this year, actually. And it's really a pretty unique place um, among um, academic research labs. It's unique in that it's very cross-disciplinary. Other labs at MIT have um, all chemists or all biologists and so on, uh, all computer scientists, AI people. But instead here, you have one of each, neuroscientists, musicians, designers, and more. Uh, so we're very cross-disciplinary. Our funding model, um, many of our member companies are here today, is also unique in that we have this consortium model where uh, companies join the consortium and they give us unrestricted funding so that we can work on topics that are often a little bit more risky or more futuristic, like uh, the topic that we are talking about today. Third, our research style is also unique. We tend to bring together um, all these different people with all these different backgrounds, the artists, the scientists, the designers, the engineers, to prototype um, basically possible experiences and technologies that could in a major way uh, influence people's lives. So instead of having a discipline in, in common, what all of us here at the Media Lab have in common is that we're interested in emerging technologies and people. In fact, our mission draft mission statement uh, or intellectual mission statement um, is uh, that the Media Lab strives to benefit society by inventing technologies and experiences that enable people to understand and transform their lives, their communities, and their environments. So we are about 35 years old and we've sort of added different media, so to speak, to um, our tool belt over these decades. Um, in the first decade, the lab started with only sort of using digital media as the tools that we worked with. Uh, people like Gloriana Davenport working on interactive movies, Andy Lipman working on networking and communications uh, futures, Muriel Cooper, really invented a lot of new ideas in the area of digital design and more. In the second decade, we didn't stop working on digital tools and digital media, but we added physical media or materials. Uh, people like Hiroshi, who's here uh, today, <laughs> um, working on tangible media, making data more tangible so you can manipulate it and feel it with your hands. People like Neil Gershenfeld, um, uh, started this whole uh, revolution of on-demand fabrication and 3D printing. Um, we, many of us were working on ubiquitous computing and how the uh, objects around us would become smart and embedded with sensors and networking capabilities and so on. And wearable computers uh, was another um, topic that was added at that moment, how can we make computing more mobile? Uh, that was, by the way, before cell phones existed. Um, 
So in the third decade, we added biological media as, a, as sort of a, on our tool belt of things that we work with. You heard, um, of course, works on smart prosthetics that can really integrate and talk to the nervous system. Uh, Neri Oxman is a designer who has done a lot and actually has a show at MoMA today um, uh, looking at what we can learn from nature to um, uh, when we manufacture and design things. Um, Katya Vega in Joe Paradisa's group, who's here today, um, and a, a student in my group, Shin Liu, worked on sensor tattoos, tattoos that can change color based on chemical properties of the skin to, for example, show when glucose, uh, what your glucose level is like. Uh, Hiroshi here also uh, worked on clothing and, and materials that are living and that can respond, um, in this case, to uh, sweat and, for example, open up flaps um, uh, in the, the clothing to uh, allow the person to cool off. And, all of these ideas really at first seemed very crazy. <laughs> In fact, um, we were working on touch screens actually long before 84, Nicholas Negroponte talked about them in the 70s. And back then people were saying about touch screens, well, ah, touch screens, that, I mean, they'll never, maybe they'll, they'll get rid of them now with COVID-19, but <laughs> they were saying, well, they're, they're gonna be, uh, dirty and um, your finger will occlude what you see on the screen and so on. So people were not necessarily buying into all of these ideas at first. Um, we did things like we had a backseat driver, which is really like a um, whoops, um, a device uh, or the, it was a system that would give you um, uh, car uh, driving instructions based on information about um, uh, the streets and the location where you at, uh, are at and so on. So all of these ideas seemed kind of a little bit far-fetched initially and involved a lot of equipment and a lot of money and so on. But ultimately, they all became reality and they all, um, and they started entire new categories actually of products like the wearables. Um, of course, Google Glass may have not been a success, but other types of wearables, watches, uh, a new generation of augmented reality systems and so on is becoming available now. Uh, we really started entire uh, areas of research with these ideas that initially were far-fetched. Uh, far so a little bit about um, wh where I come from and my group. So I run this group called the Fluid Interfaces and in, uh, for today's audience you're probably thinking, oh, fluid interfaces, she must be referring to biological <laughs> devices and so on. But actually, initially, the, or um, until Pat, where is he, Pat? Until Pat joined the group, the, um, we were not really doing much work related to biology and fluid really meant seamless interfaces. We're in my group very interested in very personal, intimate devices and how can they help us get to know ourselves and how can they enable us and support us to become the person we want to be. So how can devices help us overcome our limitations and so on, and especially devices that are closely integrated. Now, so a lot of our work actually in our group involves sensing the context and the state of a user and then issuing interventions to help a person um, deal with certain goals that they have or, or maybe help them overcome some limitations that they have. Um, our work ranges from helping people with uh, robots that help them with manipulation so that anyone can pick up, say, a basketball <laughs> with one hand, uh, to devices that help you with creativity, with decision-making, real-time decision-making, mindfulness, communication, attention, knowing your own body better, improving sleep and using sleep to uh, help you with other um, uh, things such as learning and memory. And our work really is inspired by this um, insight um, that um, 
basically there's different eras of computing. And uh, we started, of course, with the mainframe, uh, then the desktop, then the handheld, and then the wearable. And as you can notice, um, basically computing and devices become closer and closer to our bodies. This will keep happening. They become smaller and smaller, and they become more integrated, more ubiquitous, more indispensable in our daily lives. Um, they are starting to take a much larger role into what it means to, to live. Uh, initially, we started with very, very work-related um, applications, scientific computation, of course, in the beginning and so on. Then we started using desktops to help us with work. Then we started using handhelds to help us with personal issues, wearables. And I think this trend will also increase in that um, we believe, and what we're talking about here today, is that um, the next logical step will be that devices and the artificial becomes part of our bodies, or at least our biome. Um, so we will integrate <laughs> with uh, digital slash biological devices that help us with help, health and all sorts of uh, other issues. I don't have to tell the crowd here that uh, due to recent advances in um, biotechnologies that now we can actually program um, biological systems and cells almost like we can program computers. Um, and so suddenly this whole um, field is um, uh, basically opening up, especially if we combine uh, digital technologies, these digital technologies for sensing, for computation, for uh, issuing things, uh, uh, taking, uh, having certain outputs. If we combine those with digital technologies, um, I think we, we actually can um, again sort of start a whole new um, uh, field of um, and, and open up all these new opportunities. Of course, both are very different. Biology is slow and messy and so far has mostly been used for agriculture and healthcare, while the digital technologies are fast and predictable and, and have other types of applications. But if we combine both, we th and this is again what the workshop today is about, we think we can um, sort of think of a whole new set of futures and a whole new set of uh, ideas for how we can help people with a whole range um, of problems. So the goal today is very much in the Media Lab spirit to bring all these very different people together. Researchers, uh, industry people, artists, designers, and we will brainstorm some possible human futures that involve these intimate bio-digital interfaces. We will talk about how maybe one day, or this is already happening, we'll ingest things, um, how we will have uh, creams or, or on our skin with uh, uh, certain uh, microbes or whatever that, that uh, may give us a readout when we've been exposed to COVID-19, or um, uh, we will use... Um, uh, uh, biological uh, systems on the objects in our environment and more to do uh, sensing, monitoring, to take care of uh, certain uh, functions. So that's what the goal is for today and a quick summary. And I want to end by thanking, and it's not even complete, but many of the people that have played a major role in making today possible. And first and foremost, and foremost that's uh, Pat here, uh, who's a student in my group and um, who is the uh, instigator for this whole event and who pulled, uh, he pulled together uh, graduate students from other groups at the media laboratory, so, such as Jack, um, I know people may want to quickly stand up when I mention them, <laughs> Jack and Teja and Rachel, um, Jack is from Hiroshi's group, um, 
Tasha is from the Community Bio Initiative, and Rachel is from the Mediated Matter Group. Uh, we also enlisted the help from IDO in helping make this an exciting event and thinking about how we can make this fun and interactive and so on. And so we have uh, Shuya, um, Shoan, uh, Bruno, and Lisa or Taco, also known as Taco, <laughs> is uh, helping um, on the IDO side. Uh, we also have um, all of the people, of course, from the Media Lab who work on communications, who work on uh, member relations, um, the Nexus people I forgot to include here, the, um, uh, who else? Uh, Many more. <laughs> um, we also have the WIS Institute's collaboration um, and with Louis and Peter who are here somewhere. And um, these are at the bottom the sort of fearless leaders for all of these different uh, uh, individuals or the groups that these different um, individuals work with. So David Kong leads the bio, uh, the community bio initiative, Hiroshi, Tangible Media, um, Neri, the Mediated Matter group, Jim Collins, who's at WIS and uh, MIT both, and then Ari Adler, who runs the Cambridge IDEO office. So thank you everybody for making today possible. I'm looking forward to it, thanks. Well, as Patty mentioned, that's correct. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> open with dinosaur, and um, you probably know that I'm a big fan of dinosaur as a kid growing up, but I'm also fascinated about um, high-tech gadget and futuristic technology. That's why I'm at the Media Lab. And um, yeah, and I'm really excited to be part of this, and thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, we know we have another biological situation going on with the coronavirus, but I'm glad everyone is here. So I'm super excited, thank you so much. Um, and uh, you know, now I know that I can kind of combine bio and digital together for my uh, PhD, so I can, don't need to pick between dinosaur or futuristic gadget anymore, I can do both. Um, and as Patty mentioned, um, this is super exciting because we don't need to um, separate what is bio, what is digital, we can kind of harness the best of both worlds together. As Patty mentioned, bio is slow, messy, focus more on agriculture, agriculture and healthcare, digital is fast, um, predictable, and have more application. Now when the, the, blur, the line is blurring, we can kind of juxtapose and you know, add bio to the digital. You know, we are used to wearable tech, now we add wearable biotech. What does it mean? You tell me at the end. Or um, we talk about interface a lot, in internet of things, um, and many interface. Now we can add something that is growable to the mix and see what's gonna happen, right? So this is the power of juxtaposition. At Mark Weiser said the most te profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. So I think the exciting thing about this workshop is that we're not just gonna think about, oh, what is bio, what is digital? We're gonna you know, think about how the future of bio and digital coming together change the way that we live our life. We're gonna you know, think about you know, what if the cream can start to compete what is everyday objects start to have synthetic biology become part of it? Or um, coming from digital, what if our gadget can grow, right? So thinking beyond just the technology, but how human experience can be driven or inspired by this would be super exciting. And to do that, um, we kind of have four categories. These are um, amazingly designed by Bruno and, um, and uh, an IDEO team. Um, and Jason as well, I'm super excited. Um, we're gonna break down this uh, kind of the, the future of bio and digital into four category, synthesize, reveal, augment, and cultivate. And um, today we have a packed ag agenda. Um, in the morning we'll, be, we'll have inspirational talk from people from um, MIT and, and Harvard and, and industry. And you know, we at the Media Lab are honored to be part of this MIT community. We are not the first one to invent synthetic biology. Many people, um, like from the WIS, Jim Collins, Louis, and Peter, have done amazing work that we are super inspired by. So that's why we kind of, you know, have them uh, come here and, and share their exciting work with us. Um, and in the afternoon, we have um, brainstorming. You can look at the, you know, at the back uh, over there with the amazing view. We have a lot of. Um, cool and exciting tool for you to make prototype to show what is your vision for the future of biodigital. So I think it's gonna be an exciting day. And um, to prevent coronavirus, I, I think that we should do something. Um, instead of having handshake, I propose that you know, we learn from nature like dinosaur. 
T Rex cannot have handshake, right? So we and and I also learned from my my mentor, um, Professor Patty Mars, in her uh, augmented human uh, workshop. Um, she do kind of this, so I kind of call it like. T-Rex, like greet like a T-Rex, like yeah. and then uh, instead of shake hand, just do it like this, um, T-Rex style. Uh, that would be my last thing. And um, to kick uh, start this, I would like to introduce one person that is as strong as dinosaur because he's from Hi uh, Hiroshi Tangible Media Group, Jack Foreman, to um, kick us out. Yeah.